Arizona. And yeah, I'm excited to hang out with you guys, let you guys know a little bit more about my journey into dentistry um, and answer questions. I do have one case to kind of go over with you guys just to kind of get you thinking about treatment planning and kind of what to do. And I guess we'll have questions at the end. I will go ahead and figure out how to share my stuff. Let me see how this works. Okay. I think I can do this. Hmm. I'm trying to figure, check this out. Do I have the ability to share screen? I think I should. Or no. Is that how you guys usually do it? You share, uh, have the presenter like share the PowerPoint? Yeah. Do you know where I can find, oh, share screen. Wait, do you guys see my screen right now or no? No. Ah, okay. What about now? Yes. Amazing. Okay. So let me, perfect. Do you guys see the whole PowerPoint? Yes, you see it perfectly. Perfect. All right. So already did my nice little introduction. And so we'll kind of just go into my journey into dentistry. So I want to be a dentist since I was about five years old. That's a pretty young age, not having parents or anyone in my family in the dental field. My parents bought me this like Play-Doh dentistry kit and I absolutely loved it. I thought it was the best thing in the world. Um, and so when I was super young, you know, kindergarten, they always say, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? My answer was always dentist. I loved going to my pediatric dentist. He was awesome. And that kind of just stuck with me. Fast forward to high school. My high school was unique in the fact that we had this like three-year elective that you could take. It was called dental aid. And I was a part of the three-year elective. Third year um, is when they have like executive board and everything. I became the president. Um, and that was what really solidified me wanting to go into the dental field. Um, within that course, I got to shadow general dentists, um, specialists within my area. We got to go on um, different kind of field trips to learn about dentistry. Um, within the course, we learned about like dental anatomy. We learned like about dental assisting, dental hygiene, um, and then actual dentists as well. And the class was set up. It was like this really large classroom in the front was pretty much uh, like a normal classroom. And then in the back, there were like three dental operatories. So we got to take like impressions on one another, make bleaching trays. So it was a really cool, fun, hands-on experience that made me just realize I wanted to go into dentistry when I was shadowing. I realized I liked how with dentistry, you really got to go back to the good bedside manner that I feel a lot of health professionals um, don't necessarily get to have with dentistry, you know, if your patients are seeing you when they're supposed to, you're seeing them at least twice a year, right? So you really get to kind of build a relationship with your patients. Um, and I love that aspect. Applied to colleges, decided on Florida State University. I grew up in Florida originally, um, and I majored in exercise physiology, you can major in whatever you want to major in. I had classmates who majored in engineering, who majored in art, music, dance. Um, but I would recommend um, doing a science major just because I think you are able to get a lot of your good 
basic science foundation down before going into dental school. Obviously, if you do major in something else, that's perfectly fine. Um, you'll just need to make sure that you get all of your prerequisites, right? So your, your main science courses like gen chem, um, organic chemistry, biology, all the different things. For the most part, each dental school has like their set standard prerequisites that you have to hit. And then there's a few others that require some other classes, um, Michigan, which was the dental school that I attended. I forget, it, 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 there was some like economic course that I needed in addition, but I had already taken that course, so it just worked out. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my journey before starting in dental school. Um, and I kind of just want to share, I guess, like words of wisdom with you guys. And it's to not compare your journey to others. The dental field can be very competitive, very overwhelming, and it can be a lot. And I just want to preface by saying that your journey is your journey. And honestly, you just need to kind of focus on you and what works best for you, whether that's going straight into dental school um, right after undergrad, or if it's taking a gap year, taking a couple gap years, or, you know, doing a master's program before. And there's just so many different journeys that you can take in order to get your doctorate and be able to practice. So just wanted to preface that. And kind of instead of talking um, about dental school, I'll kind of go into what I did during undergrad to kind of prepare myself for dental school to kind of make me stand out. Um, so like I said, I went to Florida State University. I loved it there. I miss Florida. Um, and during undergrad, you definitely want to prioritize academics, right? Like if you want to be a dentist, you are wanting to get your doctorate. And that's a big thing, right? So you need to be able to show admissions uh, that you can pretty much run with the big dogs and keep up with your academics. Um, now, with that being said, you also don't just want to be someone that's good with the books. You want to be a very well-rounded individual. So getting involved in your campus. I got involved in Greek life. Um, I was in a sorority. I did volunteering, community service. Um, I shadowed local dentists um, within Tallahassee and also back in my hometown as well. And I held leadership positions, right? So I joined my pre-dental society, um, got leadership positions through that, um, had leadership positions through my sorority. Um, it's just good experience to, one, obviously meet new people, learn how to work in a group setting, um, but to also be able to practice your leadership skills, right? Because when you become the dentist, you are a leader of the team and you need to be able to work well with others, have good communication skills and all that good stuff. I would also recommend doing research. I did research. Um, I did research in molecular biology, specifically DNA replication at Florida State. Um, it was a really good opportunity for me. I was able to like present at some showcases. I got published. So that was something that was not only a good resume builder for me when applying to dental school, but it also helps me learn how to read scientific literature, which, you know, when you graduate and you're out on your own, you have to be able to read literature because dentistry is always changing. There's always new things and you need to be able to read studies and decide whether or not you want to implement it within your own practice. Um, so although research, it's not required to get into dental school, I think it really is a good opportunity. And then having a social life, you don't want to get burned out. Um, so you definitely want to have a social life, obviously don't go crazy. But um, I would definitely recommend seeing friends going to parties and stuff at least once a week if you can. Um, and then maintaining healthy eating and living that is another um, habit that I think is important to be successful, not only in undergrad, but dental school and also just life. Um, I think these are the things that I kind of prioritize and I felt that I was not only well-rounded and prepared myself well for when I applied to dental school, um, but it also just made me feel good overall. Other kind of things to go with undergrad, um, you definitely wanna work smarter, not harder. And for me, this was 
something that I definitely had to adjust to in high school. I was the person that wanted to read everything and write everything out. And it was very time consuming. Um, and when you jump from high school to college, there's just a lot more classes um, and they're more difficult, right? So you're not going to have time to be able to write everything out and things like that. So definitely learning to be productive and learning how to maximize your time um, will be good and help you to not burn out. Like I said, you want to have fun, socialize, keep up with your hobbies, kind of find a support system. It's nice being surrounded by other pre-dental students because one, they understand the stress of having a whole bunch of science courses in one semester and you guys can kind of, you know, study together, learn how other people study and things like that. Preparing for your application, I think it's really important to kind of come up with a game plan, right? So what I did was I made a Google Doc and I listed out all of the different colleges that I wanted to go to for dental school. Um, learn about what each program requires. Like I said, sometimes there are different um, prerequisites that um, school require. Finances, there's always like additional application fees for different schools. I think like LSU Dental School was like a hundred or something extra. And so I was like, yeah, I'm not paying that. And I didn't even apply there. So definitely uh, look at the finances. Um, and then also look at the average DAT scores as well. Um, seeing what the most recent class that was accepted, what their average DAT scores were for that school. Um, kind of just as a gauge for what you want to aim towards. Um, obviously, DAT score is really important, but don't sleep over it. Like if you didn't hit the mark, but you have really good GPA, you're involved a lot, you have shadowing hours, don't not apply, you know, because um, I've, I've heard of people doing that. And then they'll talk to students who got in and they're just like, oh, my DAT score was below the average and I still got in. So um, definitely don't be discouraged and don't be afraid to take it again. Obviously, if your average is, you know, really low, then obviously take it again. But just some things to look out for. And then with dental school, I mean, I feel like once you get into dental school, things are pretty much the same. You have two years of pretty much uh, didactics where you're taking a lot of heavy science courses and you're practicing your hand skills. So within um, sim lab, it's called like simulation lab, you practice all the procedures that you're pretty much going to do in clinic on real people on type it on. Um, and then the last two years, you're just getting clinical experience, um, learning how to manage patients, learning how to do different procedures and things like that, um, which is kind of basic with all the dental schools. But I wanted to kind of go through how to manage dental school from a mental standpoint, because I think that's so important. So I kind of have some tips on having more of like a work-life balance. Um, balance is absolutely possible. And in order to do that, I think it's important to build habits now so that when you are in the thick of it in dental school, you are not stressing and getting anxiety for the major shift. Um, my dental school um, at Michigan, I think the first like full semester, we had like 27 credit hours. And that is a lot coming from like 12 credit hours a semester um, in undergrad. So it's a big shift. And so learning how to have work-life balance is great. So um, focusing on yourself by setting up your mind, it helps prepare yourself, listening to podcasts, having positive affirmations. And then with work, balancing your times and tasks, um, highly recommend setting up a Google calendar, having a plan or something where you can plan out your time so you can fit in workouts, you can fit in meal prep, you can fit in hanging out with friends and family and things like that. 
also having a space of your own, keeping it organized, keeping it clean, um, and designating parts of your house specifically for work. Um, so that way you don't go crazy. And then obviously with people connecting, maintaining relationships, because it can be so easy to kind of just isolate yourself and focus on, you know, what you need to focus on. Um, but you want to be able to not only connect with your classmates, because that is a huge support system, because they know exactly what you're going through. Um, and people outside of dental school don't necessarily fully understand how stressful and tough it can be on your mental health. So really connecting with your class um, and also with upperclassmen as well who have been through it. Um, and also people outside of dentistry because you don't always want to talk dentistry. Um, so that's kind of my little words of advice for dental school. So like I said, I am currently practicing as a general dentist out in Queen Creek, Arizona. Um, I am absolutely loving my office. Everyone's super friendly, super nice. Um, I have another doctor that I work with. So it's the two of us in our practice. Um, and I'll kind of go over just what a typical day in general dentistry is. General dentistry um, is pretty much what it says. It's the general things of dentistry, right? So it's not just a specialty. We're not just doing fillings. We're not just doing dentures. Like we can kind of do it all, which is nice. Um, you get to do the things that you want to do and do one specialty all day, like root canals every day. Um, obviously this will kind of vary depending on the practice, but for my practice in the morning, we have what we call morning huddle where we review the schedule for the day, we check in with the team, and this kind of lets us all get on the same page for the day. And it also lets us know who's coming in as well. Um, it allows us to take care of the scheduled patients, but also see where in our schedule we are able to see emergency patients, right? Because if someone's coming in with a toothache and they're in pain, you don't just want to find the problem and then say, oh, well, I'll see you tomorrow. I'll see you next week. You want to be able to get them out of pain that day. So that is really helpful with morning puddle. And then kind of the rest of the day, we are just following the schedule and then some Appointments are typically staggered so that patients can be seated, prepped, and treated, and that also leaves time for hygiene checks. So, you know, while I'm doing a filling and my hygienist says I'm ready for an exam, okay, I prep, and then I can give the patient a break, then go see the patient um, that's getting the cleaning, do their exam, and then come back and then finish filling the fillings. Um, so really kind of working on time management um, is key. Um, and then obviously, sometimes procedures don't go as planned. So it can, they can, you know, sometimes be shorter, which is awesome, or they can go longer, complications can arise. So you really have to learn to be flexible and kind of think on your, your feet as well. So that way you're not getting too behind in the day. But like I said, Treatments that are performing fillings, extractions, you can do teeth whitening, um, Invisalign, crowns, dentures and partials, root canals. Those are kind of the day-to-day -day things that we're seeing. Um, <clears throat> and then as we progress, I am completing patient notes in between seeing patients, reviewing lab work that needs to be sent out. So things um, that are sent to the lab or crowns, um, dentures, partials, um, occlusal guards, which are also called night guards, things like that. Reviewing insurance claims. Those are things that they don't teach you in dental school, um, but you're wanting to make sure that the procedures that were done are being billed correctly and sent out to insurances. And then I like to call my patients um, after I've done a procedure on them, um, especially if it was a procedure where they were sitting in the chair a long time. It was difficult. Um, I just like to check in on them, see how they're doing. I think it builds uh, rapport and it lets your patients know that you care about them. So that's kind of a typical day in um, at least my office with general dentistry. 
And then I will go over a case with you guys. So um, this case is a case that I saw in dental school. It was one of the first cases that was, there was a lot going on. It was very overwhelming. And obviously when you're in dental school, you're learning and you have faculty to help you. But now as a practicing dentist, I have a little bit more insight on how I would have approached this case. So I'll kind of go over it with you guys um, and kind of talk you through how I now manage bigger cases. And while we go through, I want you guys to kind of think about um, things that you see, things that you notice, and kind of get your brains thinking about how you might handle cases like this in the future. So patient calls to make a new patient appointment and explains they haven't been to the dentist in many years due to busy life and finances. Patient reports wanting to get back to coming in regularly and getting their smile back. So when a patient calls and makes this appointment, they're obviously a new patient and you want to get as much information from them as possible before they are sitting in your chair. Um, so from this information that the patient um, gave, I can already know that since they haven't been in in a lot of years due to busy life and finances, that I'm probably gonna find a decent amount of things, right? Um, their chief concern is wanting to come back in regularly. So that means they want to be healthy, right? Like they want to be able to just come in for their cleanings and things be good. And also they mentioned wanting to get their smile back. So that tells me that this is an aesthetic case as well. They are not happy with their smile for whatever reason that may be. Um, and so those are kind of things that get me thinking on how I want to um, manage the patient and get them to where they want to be. So how are we going to prepare and present the treatment? Um, I just grabbed a couple of um, the patient's x-rays and you can already see that there's a lot going on. There's some bone loss um, here in the back. There's large cavities. You can tell there's a lot of dental work. There's a root canal here that looks like it was prepped for a crown. So the crown probably fell off. There's recurrent decay. Um, as well, chip tooth, large old amalgam fillings. Um, so there's a lot going on. Mainly, we want to know what the patient's chief concern is. There's nothing more frustrating as a patient to go into a doctor's office and feel like you're not being heard. So our number one priority is to make the patient feel like they are being heard and that we address their chief concern. Um, because obviously as a dentist, you see all these things, you want to fix all these things, but you want to make sure you are keeping the patient in mind and getting what they need to get done, uh, want to get done within reason, right? Like if a patient has bombed out teeth and they say, I want whitening, like ethically, you can't just do the whitening because it's not ethical. Um, but yeah, so um in the office, I always like to review the x-rays and the intraoral images before I see the patient. That way I can already come up with a game plan on how I want to present treatment to the patient. Obviously, when you have busy days, you may not always be able to see their x-rays, like sit down, see their x-rays before going in to meet the patient. Um, but 99% of the time, even if it takes me a little bit more time, beforehand, I like to review the x-rays and intraoral images. Um, intraoral images, it's literally just this tiny camera that I have um, my hygienist take of all of the teeth so that not only I can kind of see what's going on beforehand, but I can also show the patient on the screen, hey, this is kind of what's going on. So it's really nice. Um, and let's see, tips that I have for treatment planning. Uh, treatment plan can be very overwhelming, especially when a patient has a lot going on. Um, and so, like I said, the main thing you wanna do is to prioritize their chief concern. And even when you are going over other things that need to be discussed, um, always circling back to the patient's chief concern. So I do have some images um, up next of the patient um, of what kind of was going on. So 
patient presented and this was how they smiled, right? So as a dentist, I see a couple of things going on. Remember the patient said that they want to start coming in regularly and they want to get their smile back. So we know it's an aesthetic concern. Um, but what I see are stains and demineralization at the margins. So you guys can sign us, kind of see these darker areas that are stains. Um, and demineralization, that just means like pretty much the outer layer of the tooth, the enamel is breaking down. So cavities are starting there. Um, we see class five cavities. You guys will learn once in, you're in dental school, there's different classes, but class five um, are these. They're just lesions at the um, gingival margin of the teeth. I see inflamed gums, right? He has not had a professional cleaning in so long. So it's normal that the gums are going to be inflamed. Normally we like to have the gums um, pink, obviously with um, different ethnicities. There are um, color variations, like certain people have like pigmentation within their gums. I have that, um, that's obviously normal variation. Um, but we know that when gums are inflamed, they're usually red and um, puffy and swollen. You can kind of see his papilla here is blunted instead of being um, scalloped nicely in between um, the teeth. Poor oral hygiene, we can see there's plaque buildup along the gum lines and on, he has um, a decent amount of cavities as well. I see that tooth number nine here, each tooth has a number. This tooth number nine, it has a chip. Um, and then there's also incisal wear. These are his canines and you can kind of see that he has grinded them down um, either from grinding in his sleep or just the way his bite is. Um, there's just a lot of wear. So that's a lot that I see, right? And he hasn't even opened his mouth yet. So treatment planning for this can be very overwhelming. Obviously you don't wanna just sit down with the patient and list all the things that they have wrong. So treatment um, presentation is very, very important. Moving on, this is his upper arch and we can kind of see some more things. We can see cracked amalgam fillings. We can tell that they're old. A lot of people don't do amalgam fillings anymore. Um, I don't place amalgam fillings anymore. Um, they are just, they're very hard and I found that eventually they just expand and contract over time and you see things like they start separating from the tooth and you get a lot of cracked teeth. Um, so I just prefer the composite, which is the tooth colored um, fillings as well. But we see crooked teeth here. It's like tilted, turned, large cavities. This is a large cavity, so large that the part of the tooth has um, cracked. We see a missing tooth here, a missing premolar, tooth number five. And we also see gingival recession. You can kind of see here that the root um, surface of this tooth is showing, right? So again, that goes back to oral hygiene. And when I see things like that, I'm kind of thinking, okay, he's not just a normal adult prophy. Um, he needs something more like scaling and root planning um, to kind of clean out all of that disease. Moving on to the lower arch, we still see some crooked teeth here, um, cracked old amalgam fillings, um, non-restorable teeth like this one down here. This is the tooth that we saw in the x-ray previously um, that um, was root canal treated and it looked like there was a crown prep there, but the crown fell off. I don't know if maybe he got a temporary crown and never got the uh, permanent crown in there, but at this point, it's probably non-restorable just because there's still more decay around there and there's, it's just better for him to get the tooth out. Uh, recurrent caries, that would be here and also here on this tooth. Also here, you can kind of see the composite filling and it's kind of separated from the margin of the actual tooth structure. And that is just allowing bacteria to form and create the secondary caries, um, which caries are, are cavities. And then we see more of the gingival recession um, as well. 
So how do we manage a case like this? Uh, a lot's going on. Main thing is to address the patient's chief concern, like I said. Um, and luckily they want to restore their smile. Um, and in order to do that, we need to manage the disease. So first things first, um, he needs a deep cleaning and I would put him on a three month recall, meaning seeing us every three months to get a cleaning. Next thing that I would prioritize would be root canals and crowns for his posterior teeth. He had a lot of large fillings that with his bite, you can already see there's a lot of wear and there's already secondary caries. So those teeth need to be crowned. Um, and then the teeth that have caries that are almost into the pulp, which let me see, I'm pretty sure there was an x-ray. I think like this tooth, this is very questionable. When you see a cavity that big um, on x-rays, it's about like what you see on the x-ray, like there's 25% more decay usually clinically. So the nerve of the tooth is right there. And so, I mean, it's most likely gonna need a root canal and crown. Um, but prioritizing that. And then after the root canal and crowns, I would prioritize extracting non-restorable teeth and then doing the fillings. And then after all of that, um, doing the aesthetics. So that kind of depends what the patient wants and also what you as a clinician um, are good at, right? So he is wanting to restore the smile. Does that mean he wants to change the color and the shape? Is he okay with the color? Is he okay with the shape? Um, if he's okay with color and shape, then kind of just doing uh, disease control and maybe some whitening after that, um, or just doing some Invisalign to straighten out the teeth. Um, with the aesthetics, it um, can be really fun. I think that's a really fun part of dentistry to be able to do smile makeovers and things like that. Um, and kind of just reiterating to the patient, you know, if you want to have this beautiful smile where you put a lot of work into it, we need to control the disease because if we put all this money into crowns and veneers, but we're not doing our cleanings, then eventually the work is going to fail. And then you've wasted all of that money into your brand new smile. So having that conversation with patients is important. Um, and then also because he had so much wear, after all of his work is done, I would recommend an occlusal guard, a uh, night guard to wear at night to protect his bite because clearly he's grinding. And when you have crowns and especially veneers, you don't wanna have a lot of occlusal trauma because they will just kind of crack and, and break over time if you're not careful. So that was kind of my case at the end. You guys can um, ask questions because I know that was a lot and sometimes I talk fast. So if you have questions, save them to the end. And then advice for you guys. Um, come up with a game plan. Sit down with yourself. Decide what it is that you want out of life. Know why you want to go into the dental field. Um, the dental field is super rewarding. It is honestly the best profession. I absolutely love it. But there are days where I question, oh my gosh, why did I go into dentistry? What, what did I do to myself? This is insane. Um, and then there are other days where I am so excited and I would not change it for the world. So if you have days where you're questioning your decision, that's normal. Um, it's, it's, it's hard out here, uh, especially dental school. There are days where you are just, you don't want to go into clinic, uh, days where you don't want to sit there and do the wax up. So it's normal. It's a part of the dental field. We, as a community, we laugh at ourselves a lot. And then the other thing is to grind. Dental school is hard work. Um, and you grind and work hard now so that you can have a strong career and a fulfilling life in the future. Like I said, dentistry is a really rewarding profession and it's super great. And it's just really nice that you're always learning. You're never at a point where you've got everything figured out. Um, 
it is a lifelong journey. So those are things I have for you guys um, as far as advice. And I know I rushed through that, um, but thanks for allowing me to hang out with you guys, present, share some words of wisdom, go over a case. And yeah, I guess now we can do some questions. I don't know how you guys do questions, if they're in the chat or how you want to do it. What did you say? Are you able to hear me? Yes, a little better. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining us today. Your presentation was very informative and we greatly appreciate your time and knowledge. Thank you for all the viewers for, for tuning in. If y'all have any questions, please drop them in the chat. Um, in the meantime, I did have a couple questions I wanted to ask you. Mm -hmm. You did mention that in undergrad, you were involved in research. What did you specifically research while you were in undergrad? Yes. So like I said, I did DNA replication and I did it on the disease progeria. Uh, progeria is a disease where it's actually really sad. Um, pretty much like the kids are born and the age process is sped up. They kind of look just very old and like wrinkled and things like that. And so what I did was I worked with a postdoc uh, within my lab, learning about a specific gene. The gene was called like TP63. Um, and what I did was run like lab tests and kind of see, I don't know how familiar you guys are with like DNA replication, but there's certain um, pathways within um, DNA replication and there's a specific gene that was like getting stuck within a certain um, pathway within the within the DNA replication process and pretty much what I did was take cells from actual progeria patients um, and stain them so that way we could kind of see the different phases and how they're different from real life um, or like from normal, normal patients. Um, so it's super interesting, a lot of information. I learned a lot um, and I can share my uh, publication later if you guys want to read more up on it, but super cool time. Very interesting. We have a couple questions in the chat. The first one is what is a post baccalaureate? What is a post back? Oh, postdoc, it's somebody who is trying to get their PhD, from what I understand. It's like a research thing. Um, and so they have to pretty much defend a thesis within the research that they're wanting to get uh, their PhD from. So the guy that I was working with, his name was Juan Carlos, super sweet guy, still keep in touch with him. Um, he was post postdoctoral, at least from my understanding, because... We didn't call him doctor. I think I'm pretty sure he was trying to get his PhD within that research. I'm sorry. I think you might have misheard me. The question was about a post back. Oh, post back? Yes. Yeah, sorry about that. Oh, no, you're fine. Post back, I'm pretty sure that is a degree you get after your bachelor's, but it's not um, a master's. I'm pretty sure a post back is different from a master's. It could be used simultaneously, um, but I just know it's a degree you get after your bachelor's. Can did I say question? that or, or no? Yes, I think you did. Okay. The next question we have is, can we restore the anteriors with an optimal shade matched composite, like chip composite and class five cervical lesions and not go with the crowns and veneers in order to take a conservative approach? Yes. So like I said, with the aesthetics, it kind of just depends on the patient, right? So if a patient's like, look, like I don't have the money to do veneers or crowns and they want to have a more conservative approach, absolutely. Um, they make composite shades so nicely now that you can just blend it in and nobody would know. Um, they make things like composite veneers. Um, it's just over time, those tend to stain more. So as long as you're having open communication with your patient, letting them know that, you know, we may have to remake these a lot sooner than we would crowns or veneers, they're definitely a good, good approach. 
The next question that we have is, what would you recommend if I want to raise my GPA for dental school? Yeah, so raising a GPA, I think you kind of have to see where you are in your studies in undergrad, right? So if you're a freshman, sophomore trying to raise your GPA, then you still have some time before applying to dental school. So you can probably do it um, while still an undergrad. Um, and I would recommend kind of learning how you study, changing your study habits, getting a tutor, um, asking for help. But if you, maybe you're a junior, a senior, and your GPA is low, or if your GPA is so low that it wouldn't matter if, even if you got straight A's a semester, the remaining time in college, then we start looking at things like a master's program afterwards. So that way you're continuing your education and also letting dental school um, admissions committees know that you can still keep up with the academic load. Um, things happen in life. I had a decent amount of classmates who didn't have the strongest GPAs and they did a master's program um, and, and got into dental school just fine. Uh, life happens, right? Like tragedies happen. It's, it's unavoidable. It's life. And that's why um, I said it was so important to kind of just focus on your own journey. And if you have made it up in your mind that I want to be a dentist, it's something I want to do 100%, you can succeed. Um, so yeah, it, 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 that's kind of like a broad, uh, answer to the question, um, but hopefully hopefully I answered it. Thank you. And I wasn't able to ask you earlier. I want to make sure that we're respecting your schedule. So how much more time do you have for questions? Um, I mean, I'm I'm good till about like three. Okay, perfect. So or three question. my time. Okay. And I'm three hours behind. So I'm what, six like six? Yeah, okay. okay. The next question is, if the large amalgam fillings are not cracked and patient does not complain of any pain or sensitivity, would you recommend removing them or leave them on watch? So the large, in this patient's, uh, in his situation, they were cracked because one, they, they were large and also because the amalgam has like it's it's no longer closed it's open so bacteria is getting in there so it's secondary carries and let me try and go back and show you like that's so large a lot of that tooth structure is gone so if I just say okay like we'll just remove this and I'll put a filling back there it'll look like that and you can already see that that's cracking one, you're not protecting the tooth and it'll probably not only crack the filling this next time, but it'll probably crack the tooth and then he'll end up losing the tooth. Um, so I know it seems like, oh, that's aggressive to put a crown there, but you kind of have to think he already wears down on his teeth a lot. It's already a huge filling where a lot of the natural tooth structure is gone. So the next best option for that tooth would be to crown it. Same with like this tooth over here, like the, the, the only tooth structure is that. So, I mean, obviously with finances, if you wanted to do a large filling, you could, but in the long run, he'd end up spending more uh, or he'd end up losing the tooth kind of completely. So those are kind of the things that I learned in dental school. I always wanted to be like, oh, like, well, we'll just do a filling or we'll just do something like not as aggressive, but then it would kind of be a detriment to the patient in the long run. So sometimes you kind of just have to be open and honest with the patient um, and go that route. But obviously like financially, if he can't, afford the crown, then yeah, we can do, do a filling. It's not ideal, but just letting the patient know, Hey, we'll put this in here because of your financial limitations, but just know down the road, you're either going to end up losing the tooth because it'll crack, or we'll just have to 
keep doing big feelings, which will add up. Perfect, thank you. The next question is asking about shadowing. Um, how did you stay motivated throughout undergrad and get your shadowing hours? Yeah, guys, shadowing is boring. Like I, I obviously became a dentist, love dentistry, but shadowing, it's not the best because with dentistry, like it's everything's in millimeters. It's tiny. It's small. One, you're standing for so long and you can barely see what they're even working on. It's really nice when you get a, a doc who will talk you through the procedure so you can feel a little bit more um, involved. But yeah, it, uh, it can be very tiring and boring. Um, but I would recommend how I stayed motivated was going to, was shadowing dentists who I knew would talk to me, who love to teach. Um, and I would kind of have questions in mind, like, oh, like, like, what do you do this procedure for? How much would you approach this? Um, and I think shadowing as a pre-dent was even more difficult because you don't know all the terminology. You don't know all the different procedures you have like a general idea but you can't really ask the good questions uh when you're pregnant so um yeah i would just stay motivated motivated by shadowing someone who i knew was talkative and enjoyed teaching um and the way i structured it with time was i would shadow a lot um on my break so i would go home and hit up my dentist back home and just asked to shadow. That's how I got a lot of my hours in. Um, and then on weekends um, around Tallahassee, sometimes when um, offices were open on the weekends. Thank you. And this might be our last question for the night. The question is, how long did it take you to study and prepare for the DAT? Yes. So I studied for the DAT after, so I didn't do like a traditional route, I guess, for studying the DAT, because typically people apply to dental school their junior year in undergrad. So they're usually taking the DAT either their sophomore year or like right before they apply. I did not want to study for the DAT while I was still studying undergrad stuff. So what I did was graduate a semester early and then technically apply um my senior year so I guess I like technically missed a year but I just didn't want to study for the DAT while also studying for uh, other classes so I booked three about I gave myself three months to study I used the DAT boot camp loved it because it gave me a schedule to follow it told me all the resources I needed and it was the best thing for me personally. So that's what I used. I gave myself three months. Three months was a, a lot. You don't need three months, but I gave myself three months for the days that I was burnt out and I just needed a rest day. I didn't feel bad because I gave myself so much time. So I think three months is well in enough time to study. Um, and that's kind of what I did. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Duford. We appreciate having you today and for sharing your presentation with us. We will be sending a quiz later today in the group me chat and as well on our link tree on our Instagram bio for those of that were not able to watch the session live. Thank you again for hosting this session and we hope to see you all at our next session. Have a great rest of your day. Perfect. You too. Thanks, guys.